So thank you very much for joining us for the inaugural uh, Bioinformatics for Proteomics workshop. I'm very excited to be here and, and a bit nervous too. I'm not going to lie. You're an intimidating bunch. So uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, as I go through things today and as we present. Uh, there'll be lots of time for you to also work on the, to, to, on the platforms that we're talking about as well. And yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So I want to hear from you as we start. I'd like to know kind of what your uh, experience is. So how familiar are you, are you with proteomics? Have you never heard of it? Anyone that's never heard of proteomics? Anyone in the wrong room? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Uh, how about people that are getting there, starting to use it for their research or heard about it, interested? Yeah. Okay. All right. And how many of you are very familiar with it? Okay. All right. Okay, thank you, Ben. <laughs> okay, so the TA is very familiar with it. That's great. <laughs> okay, good. So we have we have a nice distribution then of kind of what what people's experiences are. Also, feel free to ask questions, but I'll help each other out too as you go through the workshop. You'll probably have different views on things, or maybe found a different trick in the software. Feel free to share that because that's really great. Uh, has anybody used, uh, what sort of bioinformatics tools have you used if you're familiar with proteomics? Have you used MaxQuant and Perseus? Are people familiar with those? No? Okay. Some? Yes? Yeah? Okay. From the prerequisites. From the prerequisites. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we got an A plus student here. That's good. Okay, good. And then I'd like to know what your goals are for this workshop. So are you looking to become like familiar with one specific platform are you aiming to perhaps get experience so that you're just knowledgeable and you can analyze your own data? Or are you looking to start like a bioinformatics company for proteomics analysis? So who's who's doing this to, uh, I guess, work with their own data sets? Is that a pretty, okay, all right, that's pretty common. Uh, anybody that's not working with their own data sets, what, what is your goal? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. That's wonderful. We've, uh, so I think uh, recently the Canadian National Proteomics Network partnered with the Canadian National uh, Network of Scientific Platforms, which is very much dedicated to core facilities and scientific platform managers. And bioinformatics tools is a really new area, I think. And so it's welcome. It's great to have you here. Yes. Anyone else? Everyone talk about their their goal for the workshop. Yes. I started my uh, learning bioinformatics from genomics. Mm -hmm. And while doing it again and again, to be honest, uh, I got a bit bored. Okay. So <laughs> when professor advised uh, to look at proteomics, I saw how it's different and, and complex and very Jones. interesting. Yes, I <laughs> So. And in addition, it gives uh, another perspective on the same uh, uh, phenomenon that we see uh, on the genome level. So it's even more interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's an excellent point that you make because a lot of what you'll see in what how we analyze proteomics data, you, you know, we take a lot from genomics. We use genomic sequences and we use different tools that overlap. But genomics, I think a lot of platforms in genomics analysis are very well established and quite routine. Whereas in proteomics, now we're getting to the point where it's more routine, uh, but there's still a lot of room for growth. And so I kind of think as genomics is kind of like the, the senior that has been around for a while and like we know what they're doing, whereas proteomics is more like the teenager that's like getting there and it's growing up and we can try different things. It's kind of fun and edgy, maybe bad sometimes, that sort of analysis. And I also want you to think as you go through the workshop, what is the critical question that you have coming into this workshop? So is it, you know, how do I use a particular tool or how do I analyze my data or how do I visualize my data? Uh, what are the statistical plot like tests that I should use? Yeah. More of like first major question is how the data is generated. Yes. And the second major question is like, which steps does the analysis of this data involve and like how? how each of the steps can be either improved or done differently. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. does it actually mean? Right, right, excellent. So, so we will cover many of those, if not all of them in the workshop. And the idea is to give you a basis to understand what the software is doing and a basis for how mass spectrometers work and generate the data and how to analyze it. 
so that you can take that and adapt it to your own data sets, to different platforms. Uh, you can go more independent on your analyses and to be creative in how you present and visualize your data. And so really we wanna provide you with that foundation as a jumping off point to do your own, your own work. And so by the end of the lecture today, you'll understand the theory of mass spectrometry. We'll also introduce you to different terminology. So you'll be able to define what these different terms mean. And we'll go through the terminology throughout the workshop. So you'll hear it over and over again, or you may see it in different ways to kind of solidify that. You'll be familiar with different mass spectrometry techniques that are used. Uh, no resources and scientific communities that support proteomics research. I added this in near the end of the slides uh, as a way to really start to build you into the community. Within Canada, the proteomics community is very friendly, very collaborative, and small. We're also rather small. And so I want you to start to know who is a part of the community, perhaps make connections across that area, and also to know what are some of the resources available to support you conferences that you might want to ask your PI if you can go to, uh, nice ones. Like we have the Canadian National Proteomics one in Whistler this uh, fall in BC. That's a good one to go to. So give you some ideas of those. And then identify different applications and challenges to consider when you're doing uh, proteomics research. So when I was drafting the slides for the presentation, I wanted to uh, highlight a few important points to keep in mind as we go forward. So we want to learn and use best practices in bioinformatics for proteomics data. We want to think about data deposition. And so now there are different resources available and I'll show you some of those uh, for depositing data so that it is publicly available. There are uh, considerations for that, uh, anonymization, for example, of clinical samples, as well as how complete your data sets are so that you could use them again or someone else can mine the uh, mine for the data as well and do different comparisons. We'll talk about statistical standards and Ben will give a lecture on that tomorrow afternoon because a lot of what we do is clicking buttons, but I want you to know what the buttons do. What is the analysis that you're performing? And what are you looking for? How could you modify it to make it more robust? An important component is also transparency in methodology. So what have you done? How have you analyzed the data? How are you reporting the data? Where are you storing your data? All of those are really important to keep in mind and good uh, standard practices, gold standard practices. You want to learn from and contribute to the proteomics community. So this can be through tool development, and you'll see an example of a software platform that uh, my group has recently developed to support this. Different protocols. So as you're going through, you're doing your experiments, perhaps you're developing a new pipeline or you're analyzing your data set in a different way. You can also generate protocols and publish those. And then engagement through the community too. So I'll talk about different opportunities to become engaged, to connect and network with other proteomics researchers. You can learn and use different tools that are adapted to your research question. So as I mentioned, I will we will go through some specific ones, but they're just a jumping off point. I'll also give overviews or introduce a couple of other platforms. And really, depending on what your experiment is, you can use whichever platform fits best. And so you don't have to use the one that we uh, go through today, but it'll give you the foundation to use others. Consider your audience. This is something that I, uh, during my graduate studies, and then also I tell my students as well, that when you're in a proteomics field, you are very dynamic in your research. So you could present your research as technology, you could present it bioinformatics, you could present it biological, or a combination of all three. And so you wanna keep that in mind when you're uh, perhaps visualizing your data. Are you looking to publish in a biological-centric journal where you might wanna have more, um, visual representation, pie charts, more biological connection? Or are you doing more of a technology or bioinformatics where you may wanna have more pipelines, workflows, volcano plots, those kinds of things. So you wanna keep that in mind from the beginning is how are you phrasing your research and your data? And then one of the biggest things is to be creative with your data presentation. So once you know the foundation and you'll learn through the workshop, you can then visualize your data and present it however you want. We'll provide you with the foundation to make sure that your statistics are done robustly, that you're interpreting the data correctly or you're looking at it correctly, but then it's up to you. There's many tools available and then you can go from there. 
So we'll have a lecture tomorrow afternoon on data visualization, and I'll give some examples of ways that we visualize in the lab and uh, different ways that we've kind of been creative in that sense. But I'm also very, I always love hearing from other people and what, how they like to present their data. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm originally from Alberta. I went to the University of Lethbridge, uh, so just south of Calgary, where Ben is now. And I did my undergraduate and my master's degree uh, in collaboration with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So I studied Fusarium head blight, which is a fungal disease of barley. And I used proteomics. It, it was like 2000, wasn't, it was a long time ago now. <laughs> I always say it wasn't that long ago. It was long. So 2006 or so, and we would use uh, 2D gels. Has any, anyone worked with 2D SDS page gels? Yeah, see, I'm glad you're shaking your head. So uh, data analysis for these 2D STS page gels was um, looking at dots on a screen. So it was just like staring at a pattern of dots and then comparing these dots to these dots and overlapping them. And I would seriously close my eyes and see them at nighttime. Like it was, it was traumatic. <laughs> so we've come a long way since then. Uh, and the technology has adapted a lot. And now how we analyze the data, how we quantify the data has all really changed. Uh, and it's exciting. So I really loved uh, proteomics research and the tools and how they could be applied. So then during my PhD, I went to the University of British Columbia and I worked with Dr. Jim Kronstadt looking at a human fungal pathogen this time and brought proteomics to his lab. And so I developed protocols on how to uh, look at the proteome of the uh, fungal pathogen, how to assess how when proteins are secreted into the environment and moved from 2D gels into more uh, higher and an easier, not easier, I would say accessible technology as well. And I'll talk to you a bit about that today. I also had my first child uh, during my PhD. And I like to say that because if, you know, if you are considering being a parent or having children, or you do have children, it's an important uh, process and it impacts many things. And so I do like to highlight uh, that as well. I then went on to do my postdoc at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry with Professor Dr. Matthias Mann. He is a world leader in proteomics research, probably one of the top three, I would say. He would say top one. I'll say top three. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an absolutely amazing experience. And so the, uh, the development of protocols, the access to instrumentation, the number of instruments. This is uh, also where Jurgen Cox is, and he's the developer of MaxQuant and Perseus. And so seeing how they developed the software, how they used the software, how they presented the data was absolutely phenomenal. And so th the experience that I gained there and also being in Germany was a really great experience. And so being there and bringing that, I've now brought that back to my lab. And, uh, and that's kind of where I come from and where the, where, why we're using MaxQuant and Perseus today. And then I had my second child before I left Germany. So, but that's it, just the two. <laughs> All right, and then I started at the University of Guelph in 2018 as an assistant professor. I'm in the molecular and cellular biology department, and it really was proteomics that got me the position. They were looking for someone with a uh, different technique that they didn't have that they could complement within the department. And then my bioinformatics experience has led to other positions as well. So I'm now director of the bioinformatics graduate programs at Guelph. I was uh, promoted to associate professor and then now a Canada research chair in proteomics of fungal disease in One Health Research. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can apply the technology and adapt it to what you're doing and make important contributions. This is Hazel and Lachlan. This is, I updated their photo. I used to have an older photo and they saw it and they're like, we don't look like that. So I update, I'm like, you look exactly the same. <laughs> So some of the other affiliations, uh, I'm president of the Canadian National Proteomics Network. And so if you are interested, if you're a member of CNPN, fantastic. If you are not, but you're interested in joining, uh, please do. I think it's $10 a year for trainees. And it's a really great community. We have an annual symposium. We have monthly virtual workshops. There's one happening on Thursday this week. Uh, we partner with many different societies as well, and so and offer travel awards to our meetings and uh, different opportunities. I'm also founder of Mums and Proteomics that I mentioned, and that's an international initiative uh, dedicated to recognizing and supporting mothers in STEM. And uh, Arno and I have co-founded the Canadian Artificial Intelligence and Mass Spectrometry for Systems Biology Consortium, 
Can Ames, which is a fairly new initiative that we are bringing together researchers from across Canada to integrate uh, mass spectrometry and artificial intelligence for advancing life science research. So if you're interested in any of those, please come and chat with us throughout the workshop. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So CMPN, we have our annual symposium in Whistler in mid-November and, uh, and I will be there. Yes. Yeah. We have an organizing team in uh, BC in British Columbia and uh, they've got a really amazing lineup. So if, yeah, if you are interested in going or something, please check it out on the website. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And they are bringing more and more bioinformatics into the symposium as well. Yeah. Because it's a rapidly advancing field. The deadline for submitting the abstract is like tomorrow. Yes. Abstract submission is tomorrow. That's for oral talks, though. So you can always register after the fact. And uh, and if you wanted to register and you missed the deadline, you can send me an email and I have some sway. I'll, I'll get it. We'll get it done. All right, so switching now over to a research perspective. I've mentioned a couple times this term One Health. And so what it is, is the kind of the integration across animal health, human health, and environment health. And looking at those kind of how they relate all together as well as individually, but how there's connections across them. And so when I talk in my lab that we study host pathogen interactions, we're looking at the interactions, of course, during disease, but then we really expand that. And we look at you know, host responses, we look at uh, new targets for potentially for antimicrobials. We look at the production of new uh, compounds, design and production of them, as well as different diseases and how they impact livestock and humans. And so this is the, uh, the diagram that I have that captures all of that. And so some of the examples that I'll go through are some of the um, different, uh, yeah, I guess some of the examples we'll pull from this One Health concept. And so if you're interested in learning more about it, just come and ask. All right, so we'll get into the, the bulk and the meat of the presentation for today. Uh, I'll start with an overview of mass spectrometry and the, um, and the different terminology that you use or that is used within the field. Uh, as well as then I'll move into more proteomics and talking about that. I will disclose I am not a chemist and I am not a physicist. So if that's what you're expecting, you'll be very disappointed because I will talk about these more from my biological, biochemical background. I do not develop the instruments, but I have used them. And so that's the perspective that I'm bringing to this. Uh, but I give information on the different, if you're more chemically inclined or you're more physical uh, scientist inclined, you'll have information on that as well through the slides. And so mass spectrometry itself, this is an analytical technique and the concept is to uh, separate particles. And ideally those particles are ionized. And so you want to look at uh, differences and we look at differences in a mass to charge ratio or an M over Z. I also, I have colleagues that are from the States and they will say M over Z. And it was amazing how long it took the two of us to know what M over Z versus M over Z means. It's the same thing, mass to charge. Uh, and you want to determine the molecular weight of the particles. The applications are to identify unknown compounds via that molecular weight determination, to quantify them as well. So detect and quantify. You can also determine different structural components and the chemical properties. Mass spectrometry is also being used now for imaging too. So there's many different applications and every year it seems to advance and into a new field. So the imaging mass spectrometry is fairly new and something that is being done. So to the mass spectrometer, there's three main components. We have an ionization source where the uh, ions are generated. We have our mass analyzer where the ions, the mass of them is measured. And we have the ion detection system where the ions are detected. And so this is a fairly generic overview of those three sources. So here is the ion source itself, and you'll see this, uh, this spray or the generation of the ions, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. We then have entrance into the mass spectrometer where the mass analyzer is located. And I'll talk about some of the specifics there and how they relate to the different instruments. And then we need to be able to detect the signals that come from the mass spectrometer. And that's where the ion detection system comes into play. So different ionization sources. 
One of them is a gas phase. And so gas phase actually separates ions separately based on volatilization and ionization. So it's a two-step or a separate um, system. The molecules are bombarded uh, by a beam of electrons. And so you can see in the diagram here, we have our electrons that are formed by a heating element. And that's what's represented in the top here. And it's the negative voltage that is compared to the source that generates these ions and that helps you to measure them. And so we have our um, the entrance of the analyte here. We have our electrons. We have the bombardment, and then they move through to the mass analyzer. And so this gas phase operation is one of the types of ionization sources. More commonly within proteomics are the uh, desorption techniques of ionization sources. So these perform vol volatilization and ionization at the same time. So the ions are volatilized and ionized together. And that is using a high voltage that is applied to a liquid passing through a capillary to generate a fine spray. And that fine spray is composed of different charged droplets. And so uh, for mass spectrometry, we'll go and we'll see, uh, we'll visit the facility today and see an instrument. But there's a capillary that we use that has liquid in it as well as the ions and an electrical charge and uh, different components um, uh, Gradients are also applied, and that's where the ions come through, and that is what, what is represented here. And once this charge is provided, then you have the ions being distributed through this spray. And so they come off, and you can see here in the animation, the spray itself, and then the ion particles that are within it, and the droplets. And this here is actually is a real image of what it looks like. So you can see the spray, and the ions are within there. So what happens is those droplets evaporate, they're dissolved, the, and the dissolved polar molecules are then ionized, and they're brought into the gas phase, which then allows them to enter into the mass spectrometer itself. So without that ionization, we wouldn't be able to pull them in. We need that charge in place. There's different polar analytes. Uh, so the amino acids, for example, peptides is the most common one used for uh, proteomics, but you can also use synthesized chemicals and molecular and macromolecules are also ionizable as well. And two of the most common ones related for proteomics would be electrospheric ionization or ESI and also matrix assisted laser desorption ionization as well or MALDI. And that one is used uh, for more for imaging too among other uses. And so those are the, the general uh, distinction of the two types. And then for the mass analyzer, that's the middle component. And here the ions are sorted and separated according to their mass to charge or M over Z. They can be coupled. So mass analyzers can be brought together. Multiple ones can be brought together to have different capabilities and to alter the function of the mass spectrometer itself. So some examples, and you'll hear these terms throughout the workshop, and you probably, if you um, are familiar with some proteomics literature, you'll also see them as well. Time of flight or TOF, a quadrupole and a quadrupole ion trap, the Fourier transform, ion cyclotron resonance, orbit trap, and then combinations. So a quadrupole, time of flight, and a quadrupole ion trap, orbit trap as well. So those are the, the most common ones. Typically, quadrupole is a term that you'll hear quite a bit. Uh, time of flight is another one, and I'll go through that, and the orbit trap. Those are probably the most commonly used ones. And the operation of these mass analyzers is through a magnetic or an electric field that exerts a force on the ion that, that, um, that is in relation to the charge of the ion. And so that's how we're able to start to measure it. The force accelerates the ion depending on the mass. And so that's the relationship between mass to charge is that this um, magnetic current or electric field is related to the charge and the force at which it moves is related to the mass. And so here's some examples of different uh, mass analyzers. So we have a beam type analyzer on the top and we have a trapping analyzer here on the bottom. And the purpose of a mass analyzer is to for mass accuracy and also mass resolution. And so a lot of times in uh, mass spectrometry research or proteomics research, you'll hear terms like specificity, sensitivity, resolution. These are things that the companies are constantly trying to improve upon is how, you know, how specific are their peaks? How resolved are they? How, uh, how well can they separate between different ions uh, of very similar masses? That is kind of the, 
the leading edge, what makes them different between uh, the techniques. In the beam type analyzers, we have ion acceleration that goes through an electric uh, or a magnetic field, and then separation is by time and space. And so that would be the time of flight or the TOF instrument, for example, as well as the uh, quadrupole. And so you can see that you have an ionization source, you have the mass analyzer, and you have the detector. So those three components are pretty consistent in all the instruments. A trapping analyzer, uh, where ions are injected into an electric or magnetic field, it traps the ions, and then they're detected as they eject from that field. And so they may oscillate, and that's what's being shown in the diagram here. This is an orbit trap, and depending on the charge and the mass of the ions, they oscillate at different patterns, and then they're ejected from the orbit trap, and that's when you can measure their mass to charge. And we have different mass spectrometers. So a tandem mass spec, so LCMSMS. This is a term that you've probably used or you've heard of or read in papers, and that's using the combination of mass analyzers. And so, for example, a quadrupole that separates based on mass and then an orbit trap that separates based on mass to charge as well. That combination gives an instrument higher resolution, perhaps more accuracy, uh, better measurement of specific ions. And then finally, we need to turn those signals, what we get from the mass spec, into information that we can actually process within our software platforms. And that's through the ion detection system. So you, the ion detection system allows us to see which M over Z are being separated, so which ions are being separated, how much of the ions are present, so what is the abundance of those uh, precursors or those peptides, and it converts the ions into an electrical signal. The two different types are an electron multiplier or microchannel plates, and those are present here and down here as well. And that's where you convert an ion signal into a current, but it does destroy the ion. So the ion produces a cascade of electronics, uh, like electronic current events that lead to this multiplication of the signal. So you can see that as one signal is increased and you have this, um, these plates, they enhance the signal. So you're able to detect it in the end. There's also image current detection where ions induce the current on nearby plates, and that is a non-destructive uh, detection method. And so different uh, instruments will use different detectors and one consideration is, does it matter if the ion is detected once or twice? Do you need it detected more than once? Because then you want to use a non-destructive detection system, such as at the bottom. Or if the ion is just being measured once, then it's fine to use either method would be all right. But this is set up within the instrument itself. It's not a selection that you make as a user, uh, more in the entire system. And so here, for example, this is... Um, I, I tried to block out the company names on this, but it's pretty. <laughs> we have different companies that uh, are main producers of mass spectrometers for proteomics work. I haven't highlighted, we all, there are also uh, mass spectrometers for small molecules and more chemical-based uh, approaches, but here we're focusing more on the proteomics ones. So at the front end is a liquid chromatography system, and Florence will speak more about the liquid chromatography and separation, sample preparation in the next lecture. But that's where you have separation of the analytes. So that's where you're going to have your peptides uh, entering into the system. This is the mass spectrometer itself, and that is for the measurement and the detection of the analytes or the ions. And so here's an image of uh, an orbit trap system, and this one also includes a quadrupole. So it's a combination system, that tandem mass spec. And the concept is that we have electrospate ionization at the front end, and that's where the ions are introduced into the mass spectrometer. In some form or another, there is a turn in the mass spectrometer. So you have the ions, they either enter at a different angle, or once they're in the instrument, they turn at an angle. And the idea is to um, focus your analysis on charged ions, not contaminants that may have also entered into the system. So for example, salt could enter in as an ion into the mass spectrometer. You don't wanna spend your time cleaning your mass spec with a bunch of salt in it. So they have these physical as well as electrical and um, uh, parameters or components. And so here, when you go around the curve, the charged ions will enter into the quadrupole here. 
and then the mass will be measured. And what is interesting is that if you open up a mass spectrometer and you look at this back wall, there's always a bunch of uh, like dirt and gunk and ions and contaminants that didn't make that turn. And so it is a really valuable piece to bring into your instrument. Uh, these mass spectrometers uh, range from about a million to 3.5 million. So they are like a very important piece of equipment. And uh, over the past, I would say five years or so, they've also become more user friendly. So now uh, they can be taken apart by um, like a facility manager can like take them apart and clean them. Whereas before the companies typically would come in and do that. And so it's nice that there are changes to the technology to make it more accessible because there's nothing better than actually working on the instrument and not just having it be a black box. Uh, during my graduate studies, I would prepare all my samples and then I would give them to Nick, our like mass spec uh, guru. He was amazing. And he would load them on the mass spectrometer. And then I didn't know what happened to them or how it worked or anything. And during my postdoc, my first day there, the engineer said, okay, you're going to take apart the mass spec and we're going to clean it. And I was like, I've never even touched one before. And so it was an amazing, like to see it and learn how it works and, and know the different components. We were then in charge of doing weekly maintenance on it as well. So you get a real appreciation for the instrument and how clean your samples are going into it and how it works uh, and what you get in the other end to do your data analysis really matters what you put into it. So this is, uh, so this is part of the instrument itself. There is then uh, different components such as a C trap that helps to, that stores the ions and then they go into the orbit trap. So this is a diagram of the orbit trap. It's about this big and it looks like a little football, like a silver football, but it's very expensive little football. Mm -hmm. And the ions oscillate around it in different patterns based on their mass to charge. The ions are then ejected into the C trap they can go into this high collision dissociation module, the HCD, and they break apart. So that's where you have your peptides that are being fragmented into amino acids. They go back to the C trap and they oscillate again. And then you measure which amino acids are present in your sample. And we'll go through uh, the spectra that you get out and how to translate that to amino acids and then to peptides. If you're doing more than, typically we do MS2, so that's two rounds of mass spectrometry. So you're measuring the peptide and then you're measuring the amino acids. But there's also MS3. If you're looking at uh, modifications, you can also break apart any uh, further bonds in that amino acid too. So this can go on uh, for as many rounds as you want, but it depends on the instrument and time and everything. So that was the Orbitrap model. Now this is an example of the time of flight model. And so as you can see, so the orbit trap itself, uh, the older models, they sit on a desktop like this and we'll see a couple of them today. So they're fairly, they sit on a bench top. Uh, they're not overly big. They do have a newer one that combines orbit trap with time of flight. And uh, we'll see one of those as well. They definitely take up a bigger footprint. This one here, the time of flight is, uh, about eight feet tall, I believe, is the is the tube. So uh, the idea, though, is that this, the space available allows the ions to fly, and that's the concept. And so the uh, the height of this instrument is very different from the orbit trap, where the ions circulate around the the orbit trap itself. And so within the uh, the time of flight instrument, you have the same idea of electrospheric ionization. So you have your peptides being ionized and entering into the mass spectrometer. They accumulate within the mass spec, and then they use a different technology, a uh, passive, so parallel um, serial changes in the electrical field, which allow the ions to kind of line up. So based on their charge, they will then line up, and that's what's demonstrated here. The voltages will change, which then move the ions further through the instrument. And the exciting part is when they actually fly. That's the neat part. So the ions will then fly through the time of flight tunnel, which is this component here. And the rate at which they come down correlates to their mass. And so the information between charge is generated within the mass spec. And then that mass information is also generated by the time they take to fly. So those are the principles behind two of the most common uh, technologies used for proteomics research. And then in the end, you'll get this. And that is what we're going to be working with today 
and looking how do we go from this into biomarkers, for example. And that's what we'll go through. Any questions on the mass spectrometry portion before I switch a little bit here and go into proteomics? Um, I mean, I don't know if we're going to um, see this later as well, but I'm I'm just curious about, um, like, for me, seeing, seeing the, um, the peaks and so, like, for instance, uh, when I have been reading literature as well, like, from um, uh, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometer, and uh, time of flight machine or so, like, w without uh, what, what the software shows and so, mm -hmm. to me, like, it looks sort of the same, mm -hmm. like uh, what would be like the difference between these readings or like, like for instance, when when you have one read of, of, of one of uh, liquid from of, of one, one of each of these uh, machines that we chose, mm. that you chose? Mm. So kind of what is the difference between the, the two difference? instruments? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the output files are slightly different and they're all, they all generate mass spectra. So in the end, they all generate the similar mass spectra, but the ions they measure are different, uh, could be different depending on the parameters. And we will talk about some of the settings and the parameters that we use. Um, also, whether an ion perhaps is better suited and measured with the, the time of flight or on the orbit trap could also be a principle of that ion. Um, the instruments are not designed for specific ions, like you could apply the same sample to both but you will always get different, slightly different data, even if it's the exact same sample. Uh, and it's because of how they run, how fast they are, how quickly they measure the, the voltage that they use. Uh, you could change many of the parameters to match up identical between the instruments, uh, but you'll still get slightly different, uh, slightly different profiles in the end. Although the data can be analyzed very similarly once you have it in the same format, yeah. Yeah, it's a really great question because that's part of the competition between the companies, right? Some of them boast higher resolution, some of them boast more specificity or more selectivity, uh, and there's trade-offs uh, in each of the approaches. Yeah. All right, so now we'll talk more about proteomics itself. And so proteomics uh, is a tool for measuring proteins within a biological sample. You typically, or at least within the context of this course, we're using high resolution mass spectrometry to identify those proteins. And so this is an image uh, that I took uh, of the mass spectrometer I was using during my postdoc. And so this portion here is actually the capillary. So that's where the ions are entering into the mass spectrometer. And there's a tiny little gap between the glass end of this capillary and entrance into the mass spec itself. And that is where the ions fly. That's the spray that is generated. And then they will enter into the capillary of the mass spectrometer here and go through the Orbitrap instrument. And so it was uh, it was our job because you would, you would sign up for two days or two weeks on the instrument, depending on your experiments. And it was very competitive to get time on the mass specs. So you had to make sure, like if your samples weren't running or if there was a problem with your samples, other people in the group would know and you would get messages, like your samples aren't running. So you would check the spray and you would look at that. I showed you that image of the spray. You would watch that. We had a video, video of it and you would log into the mass spectrometer and you would look at the spray and you would watch it and make sure that it was moving. And sometimes there would be a big droplet that formed. And you, if you run your samples on a mass spec, you'll be aware of this, a big drop it would form, which is a big problem because it means your ions are sitting in that liquid. They're not going into the mass spec. So at 11 o'clock at night, you would drive into the facility and you would change things and try to get it working. And it, it's good learning experience, but it was, it was stressful. So the, the neat thing about proteomics is that you really can use it. You can use diverse instrumentation and you can apply it to many different things. So I'm sure if we pulled people in the room here, what samples you're working with or what your research question is, it would everybody would have a different uh, a different answer to that question, at least hopefully, unless you know you're competing and then that's a different story. But you all have your own take on what you're doing and your purpose. We want to combine these ion measurements with the genome annotation. So we mentioned earlier about the complementation between genome and proteome or also de novo sequencing. If you don't have a genome annotation, how can you generate uh, data from uh, proteome profiling? 
The image here is uh, showing some of the increases over time. So the increase in mass spectrometry applied to proteomics, the combination of mass spectrometry and bioinformatics applied to proteomics, and then for my own research, the continuation into infectious disease research. And as you see, these each increased quite a bit since the early 2000s with a very rapid uptake, I would say in the last five to eight years, where the bioinformatics tools have gotten a lot stronger and a lot more competitive in what they're doing and how you use them, and also more user-friendly and accessible so that it's no longer you need to be a bioinformatician with expertise in all these different platforms to use them. You can now use them from more of a biologist perspective. And that really gives us a lot more power in what we do. So th there's three main uh, types of proteomics that are typically described. The first being top-down approaches. And this is where you're working with a purified protein or a, a complex of a few proteins. And you're looking to analyze that intact protein for the identification of the complexes. So what is it interacting with, as well as different proteoforms. And so proteoforms is quite a uh, up and coming term, I would say. Is there anyone here that's focused on proteoform research at all? Or no? Is that a yes? Oh. No? <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically proteoforms are the same protein, but with modifications. So does it have a, like a substituted amino acid that changes its structure or its function? Is there a modification that changes the function? And for example, in uh, medical research now, there's a lot more uh, diseases being attributed to post-translational modifications than to actually a protein itself. And so this is a, quite an up and coming field of proteoforms. However, top-down has been around for quite a while, but the software analysis for this is not as adapted as bottom-up, which is what we'll talk about today. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, do you consider uh, glycolization for the protein as this kind of modification? Because, for example, in my study, uh, you know, I'm checking the special pathway, mm -hmm. which the end result is the glycolization for the proteins. Mm -hmm. And we are looking for to see if, uh, you know, this glycolization is different or not. Just I wanted to make sure, you know, you consider, you know, this group of modification for the top-down microtomics or it's the other category? Other categories as well, yes. So top-down can look for modifications, glycosylation being one of them. Uh, we can also do it in bottom-up proteomics, uh, which is what we'll focus on here, where you can look for glycosylation events. It's it's challenging, it is for sure, uh, but you get all the data you need to from the analysis, yes, yeah. And so for top-down, you're really looking for that full sequence coverage. It's really allowing you to study one protein, the structure of it, um, how it interacts with others in detail. The flip side of that is uh, bottom-up proteomics. And that's where what we will emphasize in this workshop. And the more, I would say, common uh, application of proteomics research, it's very discovery-driven. And that's where you take proteins from your sample, you digest them into peptides, and then you map those peptides back to proteins after they're measured on the mass spec. And so that is then using the uh, liquid chromatography that I mentioned, as well as the mass spectrometer and measuring those peptides. And we'll talk about how you go from peptides to mass spec to, I mean, to peptides to proteins as well. And so this is uh, one that can be used for whole proteome analysis. You can also look at modifications uh, on specific proteins or on peptides, and it's very good for high throughput analysis as well. And then targeted proteomics is the other most common term, and that is where you are looking for specific peptides within a sample. Typically, it's coupled with a discovery approach. And so it's a similar concept to the bottom up. You have whole proteins and you digest them into peptides. It's very similar. But here, instead of saying to the instrument, I want to know what peptides are in my sample, here you're telling it, I want to know if these peptides are in my sample and at what quantities. And so it is, it's more directed for perhaps biomarker discovery, where you've done like a bottom up experiment, you know, all of the peptides and the proteins in your sample and the abundance. But now you want to see, I have a whole panel of blood samples from patients and I want to know, do they have this protein and at what abundance? And so that's more where you're using targeted proteomics. Some of the other common terms, and uh, we'll go through these in the modules as well. So I'll just introduce them here. There's data-dependent acquisition. And so DDA, 
This is the traditional or most common approach to bottom-up proteomics. And that's where you're telling the instrument, we're going to look at these top 10 or top N. It can be depending on your experiment and your preference, how many. Top 10 is a typical one. Most abundant peptides that are sur surveyed within a certain time frame. So when you put uh, ions into the, um, the quadrupole, the instrument in theory could measure every single one of them but your um, sensitivity towards them, the resolution would be compromised. So in order to get you the best data possible at an instant in time, you use this DDA approach and tell the instrument, I want you to measure the 10 most abundant peptides at this instant in time. Then at the next instant in time, it'll measure the 10 most abundant and so forth. And so the concept then is that, yes, you may get the highest abundant ones in this measurement, but then the next one, it'll be the next 10 and so forth. So you should get down to ones that are lower in abundant. You can also have different exclusion lists so that it's not measuring the same one over and over. So you can tell the instrument, once you measure this highly abundant peptide, stop measuring it. I don't need it a million times. Move on to the next one. So your top 10 shifts as well. And so it's a very uh, standard approach. Most software platforms and instruments are set up as the default to run in DDA. Uh, it's very discovery driven, uses, can be used library based. And so that means that you, you search those peptides against a genome library. Uh, you can also use it for library building. So it then feeds into the data dependent acquisition. And we'll go through a little bit of that uh, today and then quite a bit tomorrow. However, there are limitations in complex mixtures. So you could imagine if you have a highly abundant, like albumin, for example, in the blood, and you were looking for a bacterial toxin, that albumin, you're going to measure it at a very high abundance, and it may come up in multiple times. Uh, it's, it's hard to get down to those very low abundant peptides in your sample. And so there's trade-offs in this approach. It also looks at a narrow window of selection, uh, but kind of in a randomized pattern. So it's whichever ions enter into the instrument at that time is what you're measuring. It's not sequentially. And there are well-adapted methods as well as bioinformatic tools for DDA approach, and which makes it more accessible and user-friendly. But on the flip side of that, and more the kind of up and coming star in the field is data independent acquisition or DIA. And so this um, approach then fragments peptides with a cycling M over Z window over the entire range. And so the approach to measurement is a little different. You're not looking at the most abundant, you're measuring all ions at that time and you're doing it over, the, over a defined window, um, which may be a little bit um, shorter or not as broad as DDA. So there, there's trade-offs in that sense, but you can use it again for discovery driven, uh, it can increase your peptide identification rates. It's beneficial for if you want to measure low abundance proteins. And I'll give an example of how we've used this. We've done a comparison between DDA and DIA for uh, pathogen detection within these complex samples. It can be used in library or library free approaches. So as more and more research groups are doing DIA work and the bioinformatics tools are improving, then we also get uh, more accessible ways of analyzing the data as well has a large dynamic range, so you can really measure those high abundant all the way down to the low abundant peptides. And the computational platforms are adapting to be more accessible and user-friendly. That was probably the biggest challenge with DIA is that there was a few ways to analyze it and a few people that knew how to do that. And so it's becoming uh, more mainstream and, uh, and Florence will talk about that uh, tomorrow. This is a diagram showing the data dependent acquisition and how it is more randomized in its selection of that top 10. Whereas you can see in the DIA, it's sequential measuring of the samples. The data generated uh, in the DDA versus DIA, the complexity of it can be quite a bit, which then you have to consider for computational uh, resources and the bioinformatics tools that you're going to use. But you can generate similar information. You can generate the peptide sequences, get information about abundance, but DIA does give you this fourth dimensional uh, analysis as well, which can be quite empowering. And so we'll go through those uh, later on too. Okay, any questions on the introduction to proteomics, the terminology? Is anyone, yes, 
You can tell the scan window and the time that it is. And I think Florence will go through specifics uh, tomorrow, I believe, on DIA uh, and how exactly it detects the time and how you do that. Yep. yep. Nope. Nope. You're all good. You're all good. Yes. Uh, yes. Yep. Was there no? Yep. Thanks. Uh, so my question would be about the low abundance proteins. So mm -hmm. obviously DIA method is better to use for searching for low abundance protein. However, so how is it in terms of resolution and how error prone is DIA in, 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 in being confident that you found your low abundance protein and the sequence is like exactly this? It is shown. Yeah, I would say the uh, there might be trade-offs with resolution. The confidence would be similar because you're getting a peptide and matching it to a protein. So that uh, could be similar, um, but there are limitations with it. So, and some of that can be in like the data analysis side of it. Uh, we found like if we do a DDA experiment looking at low abundant proteins, we may not get as many, but we can identify them faster because of our pipeline. Uh, but if we do DIA, we get more of them, but we're not set up to do the pipeline as well. So it, it's it's kind of a trade-off. And that's why in this workshop, you'll gain information on both sides so that you could then apply either one as it fits for your experiment. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify in my mind, like DDA and DIA is, um, it, it is a part of a pipeline that is um, strictly computational. Or do DDA and DIA uh, need to change something in the in the wet lab or, 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 or like in the facility? Yes. Yeah. Excellent question. So it doesn't change anything in the sample preparation per se, uh, but on the instrument running, it does. So there are methodologies that are DDA specific because you need to tell the instrument measure top 10 or top 15. Uh, this is the selection window versus for DIA, you need to tell the instrument, I want you to measure sequentially every single ion in this, in this specific window. So absolutely, you can do, um, you do have to analyze them differently on the mass spectrometer. It isn't just a computational look at the end. So yeah. For instance, if I have my raw data and the, um, and all the work was designed to be DDA, then you will not recommend like to, 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 to use a, DIA computational pipeline for it. Then. Right. Florence, I, I would say not that, that it needs like the end, it would have to be run in DIA mode, but do you use DDA at all with DIA software? So usually there is um, software that has dedicated to DIA or to DIA. Some can be both, or some options to do DIA in addition to DDA. So mm -hmm. because of that, you know, it's an external. That's great. Thanks. Okay. All right. So I also want to introduce you to some of the terminology that you may see within the literature or within your own research uh, for applications of proteomics data. So here I've captured the cellular proteome or total proteome. These are terms that are that are commonly interchangeable. And basically they're looking to detect proteins that were within a sample, like a cell uh, or like a cell pellet, uh, an organ, a tissue. Uh, we do different plant proteomics. So I would consider these all to be a total proteome. It's uh, within, the, within the tangible sample. And so I've got an example here of within a macrophage, we're looking at the proteins that are contained within that um, biological system, being the cellular proteome. Those proteins can have different roles. So they may be involved in regulation, survival, adaptation, uh, infections, interactions. You can look at all of those within a total proteome. A secretome, on the other hand, are proteins that are secreted or released into the environment. So this can be, you're looking at detection of those proteins uh, or protein containing compartments. So extracellular vesicles, for example, could be within the secretome and they can contain proteins within them. And they are being released uh, through media. So if you have your culture of E. coli and you have your cell pellet being your total proteome, then the media itself can contain proteins that are then secreted and be the secretome of that sample or biofluids. So within the blood, you may have um, extracellular vesicles that are transported between organs in a communication phase, or you may have toxins that are released by bacteria into the blood that you could detect. And those are then part of the secretome. Uh, 
Typically, they have roles in communication, uh, environment preparation, so tissue degradation, something like that, uh, different interactions. They may, like a pathogen protein may block uh, functions of a host and different pathogenesis roles as well. And some of the different terms, I think you can add OM to anything, basically, is the take-home message. We have the secretome, we have the surfaceome, we have the exosome and what other other ohms you would like to look at. Uh, but this does also capture proteins that are on the surface of cells uh, as well, uh, or depending on if they are transmembrane, they may be in your cellular proteome. So it's kind of these considerations as to what you're looking at. And your sample preparation will differ as well, depending on these different, uh, what, what your focus is. Post-translational modifications or PTMs. That's where uh, an amino acid and subsequently a peptide and a protein, the mass is changed uh, because of a modification. And that modification can also then change the structure of the protein or the function of the protein, how it interacts with something else. It may alter different signaling cascades and have downstream effects. Those modifications can be covalent or non-covalent depending on the protein. You can have uh, cleavage of proteins or peptides by proteases or peptidases can also be classified as a modification. Protein degradation can be associated with modifications as well. And you may need to consider enrichment techniques. And so when we look at uh, PTMs, typically the stoichiometry of a modified peptide to an unmodified peptide is very different. And so the modified peptide are typically lower in abundance than the unmodified versions. And so you may need to do an enrichment of your um, samples as well. And so here we show just within a cell uh, modifications that can occur. And these are different examples of modifications. They're not exhaustive by any means, but they do give an overview uh, of them. So for example, phosphorylation is probably the most common uh, post-translational modification that is studied. And that's where a phosphoryl group is added to an amino acid, typically a serine, threonine, or tyrosine. Acetylation with the acetyl group that is added. Ubiquitination, so the attachment of a ubiquitin molecule. This is typically for uh, degradation. Once ubiquitin is attached, attached to a molecule, it is then tagged for degradation. Glycosylation, someone had mentioned glycosylation here, and you have glycosyl donor groups that are being added. And methylation is another common one, as well as many others. One of the uh, important components to think about when you're looking at post-translational modifications is that mass. So the reason that we can identify them in bottom proteomics is because that modification changes the mass of that amino acid. And we know that we can measure mass in the mass spectrometer. And so you can measure that change in mass between modified and unmodified, and that's how you know that it, it is uh, modified. For phosphorylation, for example, it's the addition of a phospho group, so or a phosphate group. So it's a very specific modification. You can tell the instrument, I want you to look for this change in about 80 Daltons, and that's the modification. For the glycosylation, that one is just bigger than like 200 Daltons, I believe. So it could be one glycosylation event at 200, it could be seven at 1400. So that's where modifications are a little bit challenging because you need to tell the instrument, I want you to define anything over this mass as glycosylation, but then you need to really make sure that that is the case. So you can look at the spectra and you can see the different modifications that occur. Uh, another really neat feature, uh, we don't have a, uh, we won't walk through it uh, in the tutorial, but it's there and you can look at it, is dependent peptide modifications. So you can tell the software, I know that my samples are, are phosphorylated because I enrich for them. Look for all the phosphorylated proteins and it will give you a list of all the phosphorylated proteins. Or you could tell it, I want you to tell me which modifications are in my sample. And it will look for every mass change that it measures and give you an output of all the potential modifications that have occurred within your sample. So it's an unbiased way to analyze your data as well. Yes. Uh, mass change compared to what? Like what is the... Yes, yes. So it's a mass change compared to the unmodified form. So when we look at the spectra, I'll show you a modification. So you have the unmodified uh, uh, amino acid will come up at one site. And then the modification, once it's once it, the bond is broken between it, the mass will shift. 
So for uh, phosphorylation, that phospho group is added to serine, say we add it to serine. So we have serine measured, and then there's a slight shift in the mass if a phospho group was removed from it. And so that's where you get the comparison. And the software then tells you this amino acid is likely modified because of that mass shift. Yes. Um, is it known how many uh, modifications can be detected? Let's say there is modification, modification and several amino acids, and this like probably will make this spectra unidentifiable if the tool is not adjusted to search for that many modifications. Yeah. So the question is about how many modifications can be on a peptide. And you're absolutely right. There's a limit biologically to how many modifications, but then how many can you actually measure in the mass spec? So for example, phosphorylation, you could have a peptide that had a serine, threonine, tyrosine, and each of them are modified. Each of them were phosphorylated in theory. But if they were beside each other, there would probably be a hindrance, uh, a structural hindrance to having two phosphate groups attaching to two amino acids right side by side. And so one, you may not be able to detect it in the mass spec uh, the because they're so close, or it may not happen. Maybe biologically, it's not sustainable. Um, but you could have methylation uh, as well occurring. You could have a settle. You could have multiple um, modifications with within a single peptide on a single amino acid. You can do MS to the N in theory. So if you had an amino acid and you looked at it, MS one for the peptide, MS two for the amino acid, MS three for modification. You could in theory do MS four to find other modifications, but the odds of those bonds being broken already um, hinder that. So, so there's definitely, I would say, biological and technical um, limitations to how many modifications we can measure. Uh, but in theory, yes, you can measure them, yeah. So another, uh, another consideration or, or um, ex examples or experiments we can work with are protein-protein interactions. And so we mentioned protein complexes in the in the concept of top down proteomics, but we can also do it with bottom up proteomics. And so this is where you're looking at um, you could use affinity purification. So you may have a tagged bait protein that you bind to a resin and then you wash uh, lysate over top of it to find those interacting proteins. Uh, or you may work within, say, a macrophage and you have a tagged protein in there and you burst it and pull out the interacting proteins. Uh, there's different approaches to it. Localization is information you can gain. So if you're doing it within a, like a, a cell, within a contained cell, for example, you could see is a protein within the mitochondria, within the nucleus, within the membrane, within the cytoplasm, and what is interacting around that space. There's different tools such as BioID to look at uh, localization and spatial information. You can also uh, define these interactions. So is it one protein to a protein or is it to a complex of proteins? You can gain information like that. Is it between biological systems? So are you looking at proteins within um, E. coli or are you looking at it between E. coli and macrophage? That there's a lot of flexibility there. And you can look at those different complexes. You can explore spatial and temporal relationships. So not only in the cell where the location is of the interactions, but at what time? So if you add in a, um, a uh, reagent to stimulate macrophage to produce cytokines, that will change your interaction profiles that you measure. And so there's a lot of uh, different power behind that. Enrichment is something that you usually have to do unless you have a tag or some sort on the proteins of interest. So you may do like a his tag or a flag tag, and then you do a pull down. Uh, the other approach is protein correlation profiling, where you're looking at proteins that interact together when they're under a certain condition versus under different conditions, and proteins that elute at the same time following fractionation of some sort likely interact together. Or you can use the proximity-based labeling, such as APEX or BioID, and this is where you have like a biotin tag added to a protein of interest, and the distribution of the, the radius of that tag gives you information on which proteins are likely interacting. And so it's a very powerful approach and you can do it in a very simple manner as in pull down with one protein and you're looking for interactors, or you can do it in a more complex cell specific manner. 
But one of the key things to always keep in mind are the controls for pull downs or for protein protein interactions. Because you're always going to have non specific binders. You could have proteins that bind to the proteins binding to your one of interest. You may have proteins binding to the resin. So it's really important when you're doing your analysis and considering which you know, candidates are the best for biological follow up that the controls are there to show what is background, what is non specific as well. And so some of the um, the key things I think about uh, when, when a, someone comes to me or a collaborator or a student comes to me and they say, I want to do proteomics. And I say, why? Why do you want to do proteomics? And they'll say, well, I did transcriptomics. And I think, oh, no, 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 no. Because there's not always overlap. And, and uh, um, our NOS group will talk about data integration strategies on Wednesday. There's really powerful tools to do this. But you also want to keep in mind, what is the purpose of what you're doing? Are you interested in expression? And then transcriptomics and genes is a good way to go. Or are you interested in abundance and proteins and metabolites may be more of an appropriate approach. So you want to consider that. What is the goal of the experiment? Are you looking to identify one protein? Then shotgun bottom up proteomics is maybe not the best way to go. It's like a sledgehammer for one tiny little nail. So you also that consideration of what approach to use. Are the samples appropriate for mass spectrometry-based proteomics? How are they prepared? Uh, what sort of information is available about them? Are the conditions compatible with proteomics workflows? Uh, so, you know, how are you going to store the samples and then process them through the pipeline? Are you looking at a secretome or a total proteome and does that work within the pipeline? When it comes to the computational side, are the genomes available? So that's a big thing that if you're working with model organisms or ones that have been sequenced, you have a bit more um, adaptability and flexibility in how you, how you analyze data. But if you're working with something that isn't uh, sequenced, then you may need to go to a higher order in order to identify proteins within that sample or use different de novo approaches as well. Is the experiment, um, what sort of technology or application is being used? What is the mass spectrometer that is used? That instrument will determine the output files and perhaps you know and how you set up the software platforms. Uh, what is the discovery or the validation? Which approach is this for? If you're using it for validation, your data analysis and visualization may be very different than if you're doing reporting it as a discovery experiment. Are you looking for modifications? If so, you have to tell the software which modifications or you want an unbiased look at modifications. It needs to know that. The instrument will measure the data, they will, it will measure the modifications, but if the software doesn't know to look for it, it's not going to measure those changes. And then what interactions do you want to detect? What are you looking for? How many interactions? What makes sense for your experiment? If you do a interaction and you're looking at one very specific protein and you have thousands of proteins that interact with it, there's probably something wrong, right? There's probably the odds of thousands of proteins interacting with one single bait at that instance in time leads you to think that there are other things going on. So a lot of um, a lot of what we do is looking at the data, analyzing it, and then asking questions. Does this make sense? Is this portraying what I want it to? Uh, is my comparison robust as well? And so I'd like to go through some uh, different applications of proteomics. And these are uh, captured from my lab and from our nose lab as well, and showing you different uh, ways that we apply proteomics and bioinformatics and to study uh, different concepts. So for example, here uh, from our nose group is a diagnostic approach. And so using mass spectrometry, and this is a combination of DDA and DIA, and so those terms you're now familiar with, and combining it with artificial intelligence machine learning to detect peptide signatures in samples. And so here, urine samples uh, back, were spiked with bacterial cultures, mass spectrometry, proteomics is performed, identify the proteins and the peptides in those samples, and then using machine learning, delineate which uh, pathogen is causing the infection within those specific samples. And so it's a combination of all the different um, tools that we have available for a diagnos diagnostics approach. In my lab, we use a lot of proteomics and discovery-driven proteomics for infectious disease research. And so we look at interactions between a host and a pathogen or multiple pathogens. So how does the host defend itself from infection? And then how does the pathogen adapt to that hostile environment of the host? And if you have more than one pathogen, how do they interact as well? 
You can look at physical interactions between them. You can look at changes and modifications. You can look at global proteome profiling or the total proteome changes uh, as well. So you have a lot of power to combine these different approaches together to get information on multiple biological systems within a single experiment. On the last, on Wednesday, uh, in one of the last modules, I'll talk a bit about this multi-species detection and proteomics and how we use it. But basically this can all be done bioinformatically now. So about, I'd say 10, 15 years ago, anything that was looking at two species brought together, like a macrophage infected with bacteria, for example, they would be physically separated uh, at the experiment level in the lab and then run on the mass spectrometer. So you would have a lot more, a lot of loss of proteins that were in the sample. You could have a lot more technical variation between samples depending on prep. Whereas now we look at everything together and bioinformatically we separate it out. Uh, and it makes it very powerful when we want to look at disease research. In the concept of cancer research as well, there's different applications. Uh, and so using this is again from our nose group, uh, multi-layer networks as well as machine learning and applying that to different diseases and how it can be integrated across uh, different um, data sets as well as um, integration across like transcriptomics, genomics, proteomics, and the considerations for that as well. The different features that you can extract and gain from information and then how those features can be used to stratify to stratify patients, for example, into different cohorts, perhaps um, identification of optimal treatment depending on the cohort as well. For drug discovery, uh, this is one that we commonly use in the lab and it's a combination of computational approaches and experimental approaches. So you can use uh, mass spectrometry based proteomics to identify new targets that may uh, like a virulence factor that could be a potential target of a drug. You could look at the effect of the drug on the total proteome. So perhaps you're looking for on and off target effects of a compound and how it interacts with the proteome, what its targets are, what you think it's targeting and other things that it is. You can look at um, uh, efficacy of the drug as well and bioavailability to look at how much of it is available at certain areas and how effective it is and different approaches in that sense too. We also apply proteomics to look at agricultural questions and applications. And so it's not just in a health context. This is very adaptable to environmental, uh, agricultural, veterinary, many different avenues to explore. And so you can use you know, once you have a pipeline in place, whether it be the experimental or the bioinformatics, you can really adapt it to any biological question that you're interested in. So here we're looking at um, mycotoxin accumulation in wheat, for example. How does the plant respond to this toxin and how does it adapt to remodel its proteome? One of the limitations is that the more and more that you, uh, the more complex your samples are, there's always the technical limitation of the instrument. So the instruments, the upper limit of detection for number of proteins may sit around 10,000, give or take, maybe up to 11,000 on newer instruments. But you have to consider that when you're looking at your sample sets. So if you're measuring E. coli and 10,000 proteins is your max, e. coli doesn't have 10,000 proteins. So in theory, you could measure all of them. You probably won't, but you could. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're looking at wheat, there's 120,000 proteins. You're never gonna measure all of them. So there's always these limitations in what we do. Um, another uh, publication from our NOS group is uh, art looking at uh, using artificial intelligence approaches to, um, to look at batch effects and to identify batch effects and then correct for them. And Florence will go through different types of batch effects that occur within samples. And as from the bioinformatic perspective, this is something that you'll see in your data right away. So we'll go through different ways to visualize data, but a principal component analysis plot is a very uh, general unbiased way to look at data. And you've got your samples, maybe you have treated and untreated, and that's what you expect to come up. Treated on one side, untreated on the other, great. But instead, your PCA shows samples on Tuesday, Thursday, one month ago, three years ago. That's not valuable. There's no biological context behind that. And so then using tools to correct for those batch effects are really powerful to allow you to do things with your data that maybe you thought you wouldn't be able to analyze or gain information from.
also technology approaches. So I mentioned early on about how, um, you know, when you think about your research and you think about proteomics and bioinformatics, do you want to phrase it in a biological context, proteomics, technology, bioinformatics? So here uh, we went through and we did a recent comparison of DDA to DIA and looking at host pathogen interactions. So looking at high abundant host proteins and low abundant peptide or pathogen proteins. And what kind of comparisons do we get? What identifications do we get? And in this particular study, we identified um, a new, a virulence target or a anti-virulence target, a virulence factor that we wouldn't have seen with DDA. And so it shows you like the depth of coverage and the power of using different approaches uh, to analyze your data. And then recently we also adapted our proteomics workflow for a biotechnology approach. So molecular farming is the process of producing drugs or antibodies in plants. And we've applied proteomics to the three different aspects of this, looking at the bacteria, looking at the plant, looking at the target protein production. And from that, we identified proteins that are produced by the plant that actually destroy the target, destroy the protein that want the drug target that we're trying to produce. So if we silence those, we then increase our production. So you can think about proteomics in a very foundational Bio, like uh, biological question or in a very translational application-based question? And how can we apply the tool to really leverage and adapt and make progress in various areas? So, uh, so those are some examples of where we apply it. And then uh, just as we uh, last 15 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about some of the challenges. So when I was thinking about this, I thought about the challenges in three different ways. One is biological challenges. Uh, which you may experience within the wet lab or within your experimental design. One is more the technical computational challenges, and then one is the bioinformatics challenges. So for the biological challenges, some of the ones we face are a snapshot in time. So anything that we do when we take a sample and we prepare it in our pipeline, that is what we're looking at. We don't see any of the proteins before that or after that, it's one snapshot. So it can be limiting. You can get a lot of information at that point, but we don't know other things. The protein production levels, the abundance of your protein is also something to consider. If you're looking at low abundant uh, proteins versus high abundant ones, or you wanna compare them across samples, then that uh, consistency or that level of detection can also be a challenge as well. And there are ways to adapt to that. Perhaps DIA would be an approach to use if you know you have a very low abundant uh, protein in your sample set. The complexity of the sample, if you're working with like a host and pathogen proteins, uh, that's quite complex. If you're looking at um, uh, tears or saliva, for example, that would be less complex than looking at blood or um, an organ tissue, something along those lines. Whether the genome annotations are available. And so if it is well sequenced and annotated and the proteome is predicted and you have uh, gene ontology associated with it, gives you a lot of power when you go to do your bioinformatics. Whereas you, if you don't have the genome sequence, what are your approaches? How are you going to um, analyze your data and what can you get from it? The sample availability or amount. If you're working with clinical samples, they can be really restricted in their availability and the amount. The pressure of working with them could be very high. Whereas if you're growing E. coli in the lab, well, you can grow it again tomorrow. So that's another thing to consider in your um, preparation. Ethical considerations. This is something that we're bringing more and more into our research is, you know, where are the samples collected? How are they stored? How's the data stored? Uh, you know, how are you sharing samples? All those things are important for consideration. And then translating those foundational research into, into application. So if I do a discovery-based experiment and identify putative biomarkers, could I then work with a clinician to look and see if those biomarkers are really present in individuals facing that infection? So you can work from that entire pipeline. Some of the technical challenges, so sample preparation, techniques that are used in sample preparation, and Florence will go through those uh, today in module two. The instrument availability, so do I have a time of flight instrument available, an orbit trap instrument? Is it the latest technology? Is it an older technology? That all those considerations then contribute to the data that you can expect to recover from those instruments. The reproducibility between samples, of course you want that to be as high as possible. And if you're working with uh, cultures that are grown in the lab, that you can be pretty reproducible. If you're working with human samples, 
there's a lot of variation there we can't control for. Differences across the instruments, the labs, uh, the running time, everything like that. If you're processing in your lab or a facility or in a collaborator's lab, you'll get different data sets uh, across the board. Different running on the mass spec, the columns. So I talked about that electrospray and the droplet that can form. You know, is there clogging of the column? Is your sample dirty? Is there contaminants? Those sorts of things. The cost of running it, how much are the reagents? Uh, trypsin, for example, the enzyme to digest into peptides can be quite expensive. So how much of that are you using? The mass spectrometer itself, of course, is quite expensive. The operation of it, expertise. The proteome coverage, so what are you working with? What are the limitations of how many proteins you can expect to identify? The sense of the gradient length, so when you separate your peptides, how, the longer the gradient, the better separation of you, between your peptides, but the more time on the mass spec. So if you're running a three hour gradient, you may get great separation, but if you have 760 samples, they'll take you forever. So you have, there's these trade-offs as well to consider. And then DDA versus DIA, how do you wanna set up your experiment uh, to measure on the mass spec? Different bioinformatics challenges, and we'll, over the course of the workshop, we'll go through some of these. So missing values is one of the, probably one of the biggest challenges in proteomics research and the need for imputation. So if you have a peptide that's identified in, you know, three out of your four replicates, we consider it to be identified across the board. If it's identified in two out of four, we say it's not consistently there. So, you know, where do you draw the line and how do you do that? Uh, what do you do when you have those missing values? What is the best approach for dealing with them? Different um, DDA versus DIA can also give you uh, different um, uh, coverage as well. So you may have less missing values in one approach over the other. The quantification values that are used, uh, Florence will go through some of the methods of quantification and how to analyze the data and how to look at it to get the information from your data set. The computational tools that are available and designed, those that are public or commercially available, some of them are quite expensive. And so you may like you may prefer to use a publicly available one, but then you have to consider uh, trade-offs with that, support, um, those sorts of things. The cost of different tools, the expertise, as well as data sharing and accessibility, data storage and security. These are things that are becoming more and more uh, common to talk about. For example, in grants, we always have to now address data security and how we'll store our data on a server and then in a on a uh, external drive locked in our office and then another external drive locked like somewhere else in the university in case the office floods and all these things we now have to consider. And that's just one data set. So where are you going to store your data? How are you going to run it? Uh, the, for example, for the workshop, we have AWS for those that uh, perhaps use a Mac, which I'm a Mac person. And so the fact that Max Quan and Perseus don't run on Mac is really frustrating for me. But the AWS is amazing, but it's expensive. So it's like all these trade-offs that you have to consider when you're analyzing your data. Version control, and I'll highlight these with the software that we're using, uh, but this is for bioinformatics across the board, version control, keeping track of which version you're working with, uh, making sure that the person also looking at the data has the same version. Batch effects, I mentioned those briefly, and then which tool to use. That's probably the most common question uh, that I face is someone will say, yeah, but which software should I use? Yes, I know Max Quant or something, but I want to use this one, but which one is better? Or I ran the both and I get different data sets, which do I use? And there's there's no like concrete answer. We will give you the tools to make the best decisions. And then you go off and you try it and see what works best for your data set so that you're confident in what you've done. So uh, different, uh, this is some resources and connections for you, these uh, last few slides. So. These are some of the different uh, proteomic societies that came to mind for myself, but I know there are others. And there's also like um, the Vancouver area mass spectrometry group, for example, there's also like city uh, in um, groups too, but we have the CNPN, uh, HUPO is the Human Proteome Organization. This is an international organi organization. A lot more bioinformatics and AI are coming into HUPO. And so if this is in your realm of research, I do highly recommend it. It'll also be in Toronto next year. So that could be a nice, uh, a nice fit. If you're doing plant proteomics, we have the International Plant Proteomics Organization, and we have the annual meeting is in Banff in May next year. And so that's also, if you're in that space, an opportunity to connect with researchers from around the world. 
And then I've included the European Proteomics Association. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's many others uh, as well. So just some options for you to check out and see. And many of them are really great for building your community. Some of them have like uh, tutorials on different topics. You can hear from leading scientists across the world in what they're doing. I've highlighted here some of the affiliated conferences that are very proteomic centric, but also acknowledging that many of you may go to a biological conference that and present your proteomics data. And so when you're doing that, you may feel like a fish out of water because you're at, like we go to Canadian Society of Microbiology, for example, and we may present on fungi. Well, the microbiologists are really excited about fungi, but they don't know about the proteomics. And so we alter our presentation so it's not too technical. If we go to CNPN though, we can really bring in the proteomics uh, and bioinformatics side. So each of these kind of gives you an opportunity to adapt how you present your research. There's also the American Society of Mass Spectrometry or ASMS. This is a very large international meeting that occurs every year. Uh, I think they usually have about 10,000 participants and they get top speakers from around the world. And it's also very diverse. So if you're interested in proteomics, but you want to find out about more mass spec or natural compounds or met metabolomics, it's good for that too. Um, then there is also the Intelligent Systems for Molecular Biology. That is a computational, uh, more computational based conference. And they have computational mass spectrometry is one of their um, interest groups. And so if you're in that space, it's also an excellent community to connect with and, uh, and build a network across. I also want to highlight some of the journals for proteomics research that you may be considering for publication of your work. So we have the Journal of Proteome Research, which really goes from uh, techniques and workflow development all the way to pipeline plat um, software platforms and tools development and all the biological uh, considerations in between. Molecular and cellular proteomics is also very similar in what it covers uh, too. So you have a lot of adaptability. And then uh, Nature Chemical Biology, for example, is not a proteomics specific journal, but there are more and more publications in proteomics that are there. It may be just a subset of the experiments used, but it, it builds into a large program. And then there are also uh, special sections, special uh, issues that are also often dedicated to proteomics research that you can uh, look at as well. And then many of these also now are moving more and more into the bioinformatics uh, tools and availability of data in that sense. Okay, that was that is it for me. I think oh, it's pretty good on time. <laughs> <laughs>